Welcome back, everyone, and I hope you're still with us. Um, some people may think that regulation can be a very boring or maybe a little bit dry, but um, you have to admit, regulation is actually one of the key verticals and it's also one of the key discussions that needs to have uh, for this space to essentially grow. And with that note, we're actually going to switch things up a little bit right now uh, because we have a fireside chat with the 14th and current Commodities and Futures Trading Commission's chair man, Heath Tarbert, uh, is better known as the C uh, CFTC, basically. He will be moderated and interviewed by Dr. Jim, who is himself an ex-CFTC chairman and currently part of the Delta Strategy Group. Um, I'm very sure he'll be very keen to get insights, especially given his experience as a former chairman himself, um, about the latest regulatory thoughts and movements that's been going on, especially with all the excitement, you know, if I can say so, that's been going on in this year. Right, Gentlemen, please go ahead. Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jim Newsom, and I'm definitely pleased to participate with a very special guest at this year's program. Uh, I'm formerly chairman of the CFTC and retired president and CEO of the New York Mercantile Exchange. And I also have the privilege of serving on the advisory boards of the Global Blockchain Business Council as well as the Chamber of Digital Commerce. Our special guest this afternoon is Dr. Heath Tarbert. Uh, Dr. Tarbert is chairman and chief executive of the U.S. Commodity Futures uh, Trading Commission. And the mission, as most of you know, of the CFTC is to promote integrity, resilience, and vibrancy of the U.S. derivatives markets through sound regulation. And uh, I'm happy to say that under Dr. Tarbert's leadership, I think they're certainly meeting that goal. Um, Chairman Tarbert also serves as a voting member of the Financial Stability Oversight Council, or FSOC, and as vice chairman of OSCO, which is the International Organizations of Security Commissions. And we're going to go into a bit more detail on that uh, later on in the program. But he also serves as a member of the president's working group on financial markets. So, Mr. Chairman, thank you for taking time to be with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, before we really begin, would you like to spend a few moments uh, just talking about uh, some of uh, basically an introduction on your part and some of the things that are important to you? Well, thank you so much. And I, I think I can address you as Mr. Chairman as well. I'm honored to have <laughs> uh, one of my predecessors uh, interview me. Uh, a bit scary. Uh, but uh, no, re really an honor to be with you here, Jim, and, and obviously feel free to, to refer to me uh, by my first name as well. Um, it's really wonderful to be here to talk to Unitize uh, and, and particularly Blockchain Week. And of course, it's quite fitting, isn't it, that uh, during Blockchain Week, we're actually uh, doing the fireside chat digitally. Uh, that said, uh, it, it, as much as in t technology is obviously of critical importance, it's just not the same as being there in person. So my hope is in, in future years, I can be with you, Jim, and with everyone else uh, in person uh, out there in San Francisco. Um, I've often said that it's critically important that the United States lead in technology and particularly blockchain technology. So it's really particularly uh, an honor for me to be here because I think this technology that all of you are, are so heavily involved with is so important and will be critical to our financial system in the decades ahead. Um, and so the CFTC, uh, as many people know, is unique among financial regulators for a variety of reasons. But I think most importantly, this is something that was certainly the case during your uh, leadership, Jim, is that we're primarily a principles-based regulator. Uh, our view is that depending on the circumstances, it's often better to have a set of, of clear regulatory principles that are broad enough for people to be able to innovate, to people to comply with, but at the same time, not so overly prescriptive that, it, that in some cases it can essentially uh, uh, d diminish uh, innovation and technological development. So a uh, principles-based regulator, I think, makes the CFTC unique. And that's why I'm particularly pleased that the largest classes of digital assets, Bitcoin and Ether, currently are within the CFTC's jurisdiction. 
Um, and, and, and under my leadership, but certainly under the leadership of others like you, Jim, the CFTC has always prided itself in being ahead of the curve. In fact, the agency itself was founded in the 1970s when uh, the financial markets changed dramatically after the Bretton Woods Agreement uh, dissolved and there were risks around the world that needed to be hedged, that needed to be managed. And so you saw the growth and development of the American futures markets dealing things like with interest rate risk, FX risk, and a whole host of things. Uh, and that gave birth to the CFTC. So it was really innovation itself that gave birth to our agency. And that's why I think it's so important that the CFTC help foster innovation. Um, the only thing that I do want to stress, though, that I think it's really important is that this market needs to grow, but it needs to grow in the right way. And we do see a lot of fraud and, and, and uh fraudulent activity uh, and, and manipulation in these markets. And so we, we are seeing bad actors come into these markets primarily because they're new. Uh, and some of them are taking advantage of retail customers. And so apart from, on the one hand, promoting innovation, on the other hand, uh, it's important that the CFTC be there to weed out the bad apples from these markets so they really can grow and develop. Um, so again, it's a true honor to be here with you today, Jim. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. As a former regulator, I certainly appreciate your view uh, to regulation and uh, the principle-based approach that uh, CFTC has long been known for. You've been a real champion of that approach, and I can assure you it's, it's appreciated. As we begin, um, would you share with us kind of your experience prior to joining the commission and how that experience is, is really informed your decision-making process as it relates to blockchain, DLT, and, and the crypto space in general? Yeah, so thank you, Jim. I've had a career both in the private sector and in the public sector prior to coming to the CFTC. I was on the Hill during the Dodd-Frank Act and so sort of saw how legislation was made and, and how the legislature perceived uh, concerns about our financial system. But I spent the last decade prior to entering government uh, again in 2017 in private law practice. Uh, and there I had the chance to work with all sorts of innovators all around the world and really see the regulatory landscape through their eyes. And, and, and that was a remarkable experience because it really, it gave me the perspective I think I need to be a, to be a good regulator. And that's to understand uh, the point of view of those being regulated. And I had the opportunity to work with some fintech firms and some others, and there was a real need for clarity. People wanted to do the right thing. They, they want responsible innovation. But in many cases, the law was so muddled that they, they really didn't know how to proceed. So one of the things that I've tried to do is to bring clarity to the way we regulate. The other formative experience was my last job at the Treasury Department. There I oversaw the international division. And the perspective there was really important because it became so clear that crypto and digital assets and fintech and blockchain, they don't care about borders. Regulators and governments care about borders, but technology doesn't. So really this field, to, to in order to sort of reach its full potential, uh, we need inter international cooperation and also uh, some standardization uniformity uh, in the international realm as well. So I hope that both of those experiences, my private sector as well as my public sector, can sort of aid me as I approach uh, this role in, in regulating that, that area of blockchain and fintech that comes within the CFTC. Well, Mr. Chairman, I think there's no doubt that, that your both private and public experience are of tremendous value to your role as chairman of the CFTC, uh, particularly in today's marketplace and in your role at the Treasury overseeing international markets and uh, financial regulation are, are critical. As you said in your introduction, the U.S. must lead the world in allowing the development of this, of this new technology. And, uh, and we all know that applying overly prescriptive rules could easily stunt the development of this market. Uh, do you still currently believe that the U.S. is, is leading uh, the world from a regulatory standpoint and, and what do we need to do to either gain or, or maintain this lead as a regulator? 
Yeah, a great question, Jim. I don't think I can say that we're a leader from the regulatory standpoint. I do think we're a leader from the technological standpoint. But not being a leader from the regulatory standpoint is critical to ensuring uh, if, if we're not a leader from the regulatory standpoint, my concern is we will no longer be a leader from the technological standpoint. So we are making great inroads, but I think there's still a long way to go. And, and that is one of my primary uh, goals at the CFTC is to promote innovation and to make sure that our regulatory agencies and our government is sort of as forward thinking as our technological uh, expertise in Silicon Valley and, and elsewhere. Um, and one of the keys to that is ensuring that we have relevant education. Uh, we created uh, under my predecessor, uh, Lab CFTC. And, and the, one of the goals of Lab CFTC is to serve as that critical liaison between uh, the regulatory world of Washington and beyond to the, 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 the technological community, the people that are actually creating and working on the blockchain and digital assets. Um, so that's part of this Lab CFTC's mission. And I had elevated that to be an office reporting directly to the chairman. So there's essentially a link directly from the blockchain community to, the ch to, to myself. Uh, second key aspect of making sure that U.S. regulation leads is education. I think, it, particularly in Washington, people are hesitant to learn new things. People are comfortable with old ways of doing things. And so uh, the, the culture of the CFTC is a really great culture. It's all about teamwork and expertise. Um, and so uh, trying to build on that with also education has been key, uh, making sure that people actually understand these new technologies one of the benefits of, of, of COVID-19, which of course has been, which been very tragic for this nation and obviously has resulted in economic turmoil, uh, I try to, try to look at things and to see if there's anything that good can come out of it. And one of the things that has come out of it is I end up having a lot more time at home to read, to take courses, to understand. And so I have tried to use, I have fewer meetings with outside constituencies. So I've tried to take that time and invest it in an education. So I've taken advanced courses by our experts at Lab CFTC and also talked to members of the blockchain community directly to make sure that I can utilize this extra time that we have now that we're social distancing and not necessarily having as many, uh, tra not traveling as much and not having as much uh, frequent interaction to really learn as much as I can. Because I think the key thing is for regulators to understand the technological community, just as it's important that the technological community feel comfortable understanding regulation. As I mentioned in my private sector, I think most people in the blockchain community really care about following the law and they want to innovate, they want to do it responsibly, but, but there's, a, there's, there's a disconnect between the tech world and the regulatory world. And one of the things I'd like to do is to make that connection stronger. Okay, that's great, Mr. Chairman. Um, as you well know, regulatory certainty is key or is crucial in, in any market, but especially in a, in a new market. Um, could you share with us some of your thoughts, some of your work and the CFTC's work with the SEC, uh, particularly in regard to the issuance of tokens and their classification? Um, for example, whether it's a investment contract, a utility coin, a commodity, a currency, or, or otherwise, uh, do you foresee any additional guidance uh, from either the CFTC or the SEC uh, to provide further clarification in, in this whole new arena? Uh, absolutely. I think we can definitely foresee uh, uh, greater clarity uh, and information coming out of both agencies. Uh, not sure quite when, um, but I can tell you that uh, working with the SEC on these issues and a whole host of issues has been has been a big part of what I do. Um, I have the privilege of talking with Chairman Clayton uh, often several times a week, uh, but 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 very frequently. And I know this is uh, this is an important item for him as well. Uh, for our part, we have tried to provide as much clarity as possible. To, to your point, it's really important that people understand what the rules of the game are, and then they can innovate accordingly. Um, we have made the determination based on the SEC's determination that it's not a security or an investment contract, that Bitcoin and Ether are commodities falling within our jurisdiction. 
But really, the, qu- the threshold question is, is largely whether something is a security or not. And that is the sole province of the SEC. Um, and so once they make a determination, uh, we then can take their determination, particularly if the determination is it's not a security, and then we can start thinking about it in terms of our own regime and trying to provide clarity around what people need to do uh, in terms of complying. Interestingly enough, and many people in the blockchain community may not fully understand this, the CFTC is essentially a derivatives regulator. We have regulatory jurisdiction over futures, swaps, options, most of them, and and then also certain leverage transactions in digital assets. We do not have plenary jurisdiction over spot transactions. So many of the crypto exchanges that are that are that are that are dealing in 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 these tokens today, even if they are commodities, we don't have regulatory oversight over them. We do, however, and this is the important point, have fraud and manipulation jurisdiction. And so back to my earlier point about the importance of making sure that customers are protected. Even though we don't have the authority to necessarily regulate some of these exchanges, if we see rampant fraud and manipulation, and we see in particular retail customers getting scammed, we we have started using CFTC enforcement authority to to deal with that. My view being that, number one, it helps clean up this market. So the, the good people, all of you that are watching and participating, are free to innovate and there's not the danger of bad actors coming in and either disturbing the market or having a government backlash because they throw the good out with the bad. Secondly, uh, we do have right now two exchanges, uh, sorry, five exchanges that are listing digital assets on contracts. And so if there's manipulation in the spot market at some of these exchanges, it ultimately can affect the prices on those derivatives exchanges that are trading in these assets that we do have regulatory authority. So to ensure the integrity of those markets, uh, we we will start policing uh, at least some aspects of the spot markets. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, We know that some exchanges have offered margin trading uh, in regard to Bitcoin. And of course that presents some, some tension with regard to the Commodity Exchange Act. Uh, We have seen the commission initiate enforcement actions against exchanges that have chosen to engage in this behavior. And and then the commission subsequently has provided guidance uh, on the margin trading issue. Um, What in general, what is the commission's thinking on enforcement, not just as it relates to margin trading and, and crypto, but for the broader kind of crypto space as well? Sure. I I would say it's probably twofold. The first is making sure that innocent retail customers are not getting scammed. Uh, And that is really important because uh, in some of these markets, we obviously have sophisticated institutional uh, uh, investors and and that's fine. But in other cases, we really do have retail investors, uh, people that, that, you know, If the government doesn't step in to assist, then perhaps no one will. And my concern is that if if a few bad actors get into these markets and they really manipulate it, they create fraud and and a bad reputation, my concern is there will be a huge backlash, legal, regulatory, et cetera, that can effectively undercut all the great things that the blockchain community is doing. So we're focused on those bad actors, particularly those that target retail customers. The second thing we're concerned about is, um, to your point about, you know, these various exchanges, we don't want people to create shadow futures exchanges. And so one of the, the guidance that we gave on actual delivery was basically to spell out at what point does something effectively become uh, not no longer a spot transaction, but something that really is, is subject to CFTC regulation. And as a result, they actually have to register as a designated contract market. So we don't want shadow futures markets basically developing outside the oversight of the CFTC regime. That said, by the same token, one of the things we want to do is make it easier for people to come to the CFTC and actually register as a traditional DCM, which is called a designated contract market, an exchange, and actually get the benefit of federal preemption 
on a lot of the work that they're doing. So they don't have to follow 50, 51 states. They can just follow the CFTC regime, which, as we've mentioned before, is a principles based approach. Um, and so so while we're going to sort of crack down on these shadow exchanges that are violating the CEA, our statute, uh, at the same time, we want to make it easier for those that want to come to us and actually create a regulated exchange and, and enjoy the many benefits of that that come with having a single federal regulator. Yeah, I think that's critical. And uh, we all know how important the exclusive jurisdiction of the CFTC is as it relates to futures markets. And and that scenario in, in this new market, there's no doubt, would simplify the 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 regulatory component of, of these new businesses trying to get started. Um, to that point, we've observed uh, a number of foreign jurisdictions and central banks experimenting or exploring central bank digital currencies or CBDCs, uh, particularly the People's Bank of China. Uh, one of your prior roles was with, obviously, with the U.S. Treasury working in international markets and uh, you have a lot of experience in coordinating with the Federal Reserve Bank on, on many different initiatives. What do you see as the federal government's role in developing a, a CBDC for the dollar? And I guess, I mean, what hurdles or issues are a primary concern to you towards achieving that, that type of goal? Sure. So, so obviously, this is in the province of the Fed, and and we'll rely on their expertise in determining how and if and 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 whether they would like to have a a digital version of the dollar. Um, my own personal views on this, based on my experience at Treasury, is a, a couple of things. Number one, you know, the dollar has been the reserve currency of the world now for for fifty plus years, and and it's really critical, I think, to the U.S. economy. Uh, that it that it mean that it maintain its status uh, either as the reserve currency or certainly one of the reserve currencies uh, that people depend upon. Um, and so, if it if it makes sense in order to keep that status uh, to digitalize the dollar, uh, then I think it's certainly worth looking in. I think in terms of some of the hurdles, uh, there would be the question of 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 anti money laundering. And AML, uh, that has been something that has been a part of sort of the dollar clearing conversation. And how do we have the dollar as the world's reserve currency, but at the same time ensure uh, that our anti-money laundering laws and the dollars aren't being used for nefarious purposes? And so uh, that same rubric, I think, would need to be uh, applied to any kind of digital version of the dollar. But I will tell you that if, if the U.S. government does decide to do a digital version of the dollar, uh, I would think it would be very popular and I could see the United States leading. And so it's, it's, it's definitely, in my view, a dialogue and conversation worth happening, particularly as we see other central banks experimenting and thinking through the same issue. Well, good. That's great news, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin futures were introduced and I'm, I'm proud that the CFTC embraced uh, uh futures contracts on, on Bitcoin. But in the wake of, of that decision by the commission, the dialogue kind of shifted towards if or when the market will see futures contracts on Ether, which we eventually saw listed on uh, the Ares exchange. Do you foresee any futures contracts on other cryptocurrencies being listed uh, uh, in the near future? I think once you start to see more clarity, on whether something is a security or not a security, and therefore they understand which space it's in, uh, you will see additional digital assets being listed. Um, so, so I think a lot of it is going to depend upon the process of receiving clarity on some of the major digital assets. Um, there's also the possibility of certain forks, uh, certain forks in digital assets uh, that are currently listed, Bitcoin and Ether, to the extent you start to see a bigger and bigger market for those forks. And those, for, those forks, the, you know, the new operating uh, protocols, don't trigger any of the, sort of the investment contract SEC analysis, uh, then you could start to see some of them listed as well. Uh, unlike, unlike my prediction about Ether, which I said sort of in the next year or so, and, and I think it was, it was less than a year, at this point, I don't see anything necessarily on the horizon, but I think it's inevitable that in the future, once 
major classes of digital assets uh, receive the clarity on whether they're a security, whether they're a commodity, you'll start to see them also be listed, particularly as they get more and more popular and people do see them as a store of value. Well, as you know, and I'm not going to ask you to comment on this directly, a lot of people in the space have been frustrated somewhat with the SEC for their slowness in determining, you know, what's a security or not. Uh, do you envision the SEC getting a bit more comfortable uh, with regard to making those determinations in a timely period? I think the SEC is 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 working hard to make those determinations, and and of course the technology is changing rapidly. Um, I, I do have a lot of uh, sympathy for my my colleagues at the SEC who are confronted with this threshold question because I think they they do understand the dangers of getting it wrong. Uh, if something is determined to be not a security when in fact it is a security, they are really concerned about investors getting burned. So I, I certainly don't envy the position they're in. But I also understand at the same time uh, the, the blockchain community uh, seeking and wanting certainty. Uh, so what I can promise you is whenever the SEC uh, decides whether something is a security or not, particularly if it's not a security, uh, we will move in short order at the CFTC to provide uh, the clarity that it is, is in fact a commodity and therefore subject to our jurisdiction. And we'll, we'll, we'll endeavor to provide uh, with as much rapidity as reasonably possible, uh, answers and clarity uh, so people can go on innovating and complying with our laws. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's certainly uh, music to the ears of uh, the participants in this conference. Uh, you were recently named a vice chair of IOSCO, and uh, I want to add my congratulations again. Uh, most people don't understand what a, what a big accomplishment that is. Uh, uh, to have uh, the chairman of the CFTC serving in that key international role. Um, but OSCO, as an international organization, has been active in the, in the crypto uh, digital ledger technology space. Um, could you go into a bit of detail about uh, the OSCO's work there to date? And, and do you see them eventually proposing any types of, uh, of guidelines or recommendation as it relates to, to blockchain or digital assets? Uh, well, well, thank you. And, and Jim, it is an honor to, uh, to have that position at the international body, and, and they do a lot of important work. Uh, the good news is, is that one of IOSCO's uh, you know, five major work streams is, in fact, on fintech. And, and there is a, a, there's been a stable currency uh, working group digital asset working group, uh, and they do do a lot of work in this area and they're committed to it. So I think the important role that IOSCO can play is number one, educating the international community as to digital assets and common concerns, uh, as well as challenges and, 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 and positive benefits that uh, blockchain is bringing. And so it, it is an international forum where I think people can share views um, because as I mentioned before, uh, digital assets and blockchains don't look at regulatory jurisdictions like governments do. And so uh, this stuff is worldwide, yet our regulatory system is, is fragmented based on country lines. And in some cases, like the United States, even within countries, uh, securities versus commodities versus banking, etc. cetera. Um, so where I think IOSCO could play a role is maybe coming up with some recommendations and standards in how to promote uh, innovation. So as, as innovators, hopefully we can uh, solve the, the issues inside the United States by providing clarity. But once you get past the border, uh, you may have to deal with similar issues in other jurisdictions. And so if there is a common approach or framework that, that the international community of securities regulators can come up with, I think that will ultimately be to the benefit of the tech industry. Well, and I, I agree with you, and I, I certainly believe that your international experience, uh, both uh, as an attorney in private practice as well as a, a regulator at, at Treasury and the CFTC, will be very beneficial to OSCO as, as they move forward. Um, we're, we're about out of time, Mr. Chairman, and uh, let me say how much I've appreciated the, the opportunity to participate with you and in this small segment of the conference, but uh, any any closing comments you'd like to make before we finish our part on the program? 
No, other than uh, it's an honor, obviously, to be with you here, Jim, as one of my predecessors. It's also great to be here with everyone at the conference. I think the, the closing message is simply the CFTC is open for business. We're a regulator that obviously wants to protect our markets, ensure they have integrity, but at the same time, we want to promote innovation. And so we really would welcome a further dialogue with the industry. Uh, we want to work with you to get it right. We want to figure out a way that you can continue to innovate, do so responsibly, and America continue to lead in this technology. So thank you so much. Well, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And, and I can share with the, with the audience that under your leadership, the door at the CFTC is always open. And anybody that has questions or comments or thoughts that they would like to share uh, with the CFTC is, is obviously uh, uh, invited to do so. So thank you for spending time with us. We appreciate it and uh, look forward to a great rest of the program. Thank you. My pleasure.